a poor gut health has become this mysterious thing that you can technically blame all of your problems on starting off with poor skin acne eczema going over to constant bloating after each meal even your lower energy levels and feeling fatigued all of the time however i am pretty sure that a lot of you do not have an understanding of what gut health exactly is this is why today we're talking the basics of gut health and some fundamental diet mistakes that you might be making without even knowing it additionally because it's the middle of summer i feel like i need to give you my digestion tips because i am somebody that has a lifetime of very poor gut motility and even after doing all of the basics i still have some little tips and tricks that i do to boost my digestive processes all of them are completely free to do and do not require you buying any supplement you can do a lot of them even on vacation everything in the video is of course science backed and all of the sources are linked in the description box enough rambling let's get right into the video what does your gut health actually include we're going to be talking mostly about the gut microbiome in today's video but i think it's important to know that an imbalance of the good and bad bacteria in your gut is not the only possible reason to you having poor gut health that could also be due to an insufficient amount of digestive enzymes that could be because of an insufficient amount of stomach acid there are multiple things involved in your gut health today we're talking about the gut microbiome which is very tightly connected to your diet and what you're eating also shapes what your gut microbiota is going to look like the gut microbiome could be suffering due to a variety of reasons problems could be due to an insufficient amount of the good ones and more of the bad ones the bad ones could also be negatively impacting the so-called barrier in your gut that helps protect you from pathogens that are in your gut from entering your system this so-called mucus layer is well maintained when the balance in your gut is good and when that is not the case it becomes thinner and thinner which leads to the so-called leaky gut condition and a higher grade of inflammation because of the different pathogens that enter your system there are also of course some chronic conditions such as irritable bowel syndrome and colitis which require a lifetime of specific diet approaches but they require a video of their own moving into the diet mistakes that you could be making the first thing is not getting sufficient amounts of fiber i am sure that you have heard people talk about fiber it is like the big trend of 2025 fiber essentially is a group of non-digestible carbohydrates we do not possess enzymes in our body to be able to break down the fiber so it reaches our gut intact where it can be metabolized by the bacteria there this way the good bacteria in our gut is being stimulated to grow and at the same time it produces the so-called short chain fatty acids which have been linked to a lot of positive things in our bodies such as better insulin regulation decreased inflammation and better maintenance of this barrier in our gut that i talked about fiber is present on only in plant foods so we're talking cereals legumes nuts fruits vegetables there are a lot of different types of fiber that are present in those foods some of it is soluble non-soluble but generally if you consume a variety of plant foods you're getting a lot of the different types of fiber people in the west that follow a basic western diet of high fats high protein and you know low fiber usually do not get enough of it so we get around two-thirds or less of the recommended amounts maybe even half depending on what you're eating and this is why a lot of people have very poor digestion fiber also stimulates the gut motility and helps with regular bowel movements i need to do a what i eat in a day which is high in fiber because it is not that complicated but maybe it will be the next video that i make additionally in animal studies it has been found that the consequences of uh, insufficient fiber intake are present over generations and can be inherited this negative effect can be reversed in the first generation but after that there is nothing much that can be done about it under this group fall also the so-called 
prebiotics and prebiotics are compounds in plant foods that stimulate the growth of very specific gut bacteria that have been found by research to be beneficial for us. Probiotics are something different. Those are the bacteria themselves that we consume either with some fermented foods such as kimchi or also sauerkraut or just in the form of a supplement. Probiotics have also been found to be very beneficial and they are a staple when you are consuming antibiotics but apart from that there are some concerns about the establishment of the probiotics in the gut once that you've ingested them with the supplement it does not always happen but that's just another topic of research now we're going to move on to other diet components such as the dietary fat a high fat diet has been negatively associated with gut health a high fat diet leads to an alteration of the bioacid pool which then leads to some negative implications regarding gut health bio acids are the ones that help with fat digestion the origin of the fat in question did not matter that applies to animal fat plant fat all types of fats on the topic of fat soluble components and fatty acids omega 3 fatty acid supplements have not been found to have very beneficial effects on the gut microbiome when we're talking about vitamin d vitamin d deficiency has been linked to some negative effects on gut health and the gut microbiota that might be due to the vitamin d receptors that are present in our gut and vitamin d cannot be consumed with the diet in sufficient amounts it is usually acquired either through a supplement in the winter or it is synthesized in our skin in a response to sunlight in the summer right now around 10 to 15 minutes of midday sun exposure would be sufficient for someone to get enough vitamin d moving on to the favorite of the internet in the past few years dietary protein dietary protein is actually a bit controversial when talking about gut health because when dietary protein is metabolized first of all it is not completely digested animal protein is a bit more digestible than plant protein but in the big picture the quantity of the protein is more important than the quality of the protein secondly both some toxic metabolites and also some good metabolites are generated which is why we cannot really say if high amounts of protein have a good or a bad effect on gut health and i think it is something to keep in mind when wanting to go on a very high protein diet especially if because you want to get such high amounts of protein you're also compromising with all of the plant foods that are high in fiber now we're moving on to some things that definitely negatively influence your gut health starting off with high amounts of sugar high amounts of sugar have been found to promote the growth of bacteria in your gut that likes to nibble on the barrier in your gut so it becomes thinner high sugar diets also lead to an imbalance of the bacteria because again they stimulate the growth of the bad ones and do not really help with the growth of the good bacteria in your gut same goes for artificial sweeteners such as aspartame saccharin and sucralose these artificial sweeteners generally lead to some abdominal distress some symptoms such as bloating and flatulence they are most of the time laxatives another thing that negatively influences gut health are some specific emulsifiers also artificial ones such as polysorbate 80 which again can be found in a variety of highly processed foods now that we've covered all of the diet factors or at least most of them the topic is very broad and requires more than one video we're going to move into a lifestyle factor a huge one and that is the stress i'm pretty sure that you've heard of the concept of the good brain axis and that your central nervous system is connected also to your gut our gut also has its own nervous system the enteric i think it's enteric nervous system because there are so many nerve endings in our gut as well and of course it is connected to the central one additionally a lot of our immune cells are also produced in our gut this is why maintaining gut health is very important for our entire system and when we're in times of stress that could lead to a lot of negative influences not only on our gut motility because stress leads to a decrease in the blood flow to the gut and it slows down digestion it could also negatively impact the balance of our gut 
microbiome and a variety of other things. And when on the topic of stress, sleep disturbances, according to this one paper, were also linked to a um, rise in the abdominal symptoms, abdominal distress. So you see how your lifestyle is very important when talking about gut health. You cannot fix everything just by taking some supplements or by making some adjustment to your diet. It is really a complex issue to tackle. And it could also be the main reason why you're feeling bloated or why you're suffering from abdominal symptoms. It does not even have to be your diet. The main problem could be your stress levels. Now I'm going into all of the digestion tips and the first one that is very easy to do but I feel like a lot of people do not engage in it is mindful eating. Mindful eating according to this bigger paper is a system of different practices that helps you not only be more aware and more appreciative of the food but it also helps with the entire digestive processes and hunger and appetite regulation. When we are present in the moment when we're eating, when we are chewing food slowly and thoroughly, not rushing to eat, not being distracted while doing it, the first thing that we're doing is that we're helping our body start the digestion in our mouth because our saliva contains some enzymes that help break down carbohydrates and fats even as we're chewing it. Secondly, we're breaking down the food into small components which is going to help with bloating later on. We're not going to be feeling as heavy in our stomach as we do when we have not chewed the food properly. When we're eating in a non-distracted way, not watching something, not looking in our phone, we are also being more aware of the satiety signals which would help us stop eating when we're actually full and satiated. And if if we're being distracted all of the time it becomes kind of an automatic process and you could very easily overeat which of course leads to some abdominal distress of course not all of the practices on the list you can do all of the time such as meditations when you're eating at work that's not very possible the other two are already important enough and i feel like by implementing those you could really see a difference in your digestive processes second thing being hydrated enough not excessively hydrated but I think everybody is aware that a sufficient amount of water is very crucial for regular bowel movements. However, excessive water intake does not seem to help with that really. So just ensuring that you're getting enough water for the day is important to maintain regular bowel movements. Third thing on the list, again related to water, and this is the ingestion of warm water in the morning prior to a meal. It could be combined with apple cider vinegar or lemon if you want to, but I don't feel like it's necessary. I tried to find research on that because it is something that my mom initially recommended and I found a few papers that talked about warm water and an improvement in the digestive processes and they did seem to support that theory. However, when it comes down to without with lemon, with apple cider vinegar, there was no any legit scientific evidence on that, but there is generally a lot of scientific evidence on the topic of apple cider vinegar or lemon and then a lower insulin response after ingesting the meal. So you might just add that if you want that benefit. I do usually add that something just because I don't know, it became kind of a routine. It doesn't really hurt. I have it on hand. I always have a sweet breakfast anyway, so maybe regulating my blood sugar a little bit would be a good thing. But honestly, I'm not that worried about the blood sugar. It's mostly the routine part of it. I wouldn't stress if I didn't have apple cider vinegar or lemon on hand. One of the studies also suggested the theory that the lower pH of lemon in that study impairs the function of these enzymes in the mouth and then that somehow influences the digestion. Uh, but again, this was on only one sentence in one paper and I did not find anything legit on the topic but it would make sense since both lemon and apple cider vinegar have a lower pH. The next tip is completely anecdotal because I did not find any legit scientific evidence on that and that is having an earlier dinner. For me an early dinner is 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. and I feel like this way I allow my system enough time to digest the food well and the next day I do not usually feel bloated or distressed in my abdominal area. When I tried to find papers on that I only found studies talking about the insulin response the next day and they discussed that the insulin response if you had a late dinner the day before that was actually higher in the morning which is not something that is positive and I also in previous 
previous videos about PCOS have discussed the negative effects of having a very large amount of food later on in the day and the hormonal levels of women suffering from PCOS. So I think generally having an earlier dinner and not eating right before you go to sleep helps with your digestion and also could be positively impacting your hormones, not only insulin but also even your sexual hormones. I think in the video about sleep I also talked about how having food earlier in the day helps with having better sleep quality so you know just don't eat large amounts of food right before you go to sleep. And the last one on the list is having some type of short-term physical activity after the meal. I found only one paper on that and it discussed the impact of a 10 to 15 minute walk on digestion and abdominal symptoms, a bloating. It found that it did improve the bloating in people that did the 10 to 15 minute walk. I've also noticed personally, again, this is not that scientific because I found one paper but I think it is something free that you might consider doing because I did have found that it has a positive effect on my digestion and I definitely feel more comfortable especially compared to when lying down or sitting down immediately after a meal. They also walked kind of weirdly in that study so with their hands clasped, clasped behind their back and with their neck flexed but again I would not walk like that in public. You might just walk normally and see if that works well for you. I believe those were all of the tips that I wanted to share with you today regarding digestion. I really hope that you find some of them helpful. They are all free to do and I think that it does not hurt to try one or two out, especially if you're doing already all of the other diet things that I talked about. Let me know if they worked for you. I would love to hear what your experience with them was. Also, let me know down in the comments below if you would like me to do a video on a specific topic next time. Thank you very much for watching. Do not forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the contents of today's video and I will be seeing you in in the next one.